Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I declare this meeting of the Planning Committee for the Port Phillip City Council open and ready for business. And I welcome particularly the members of the public who have come here tonight. The City of Port Phillip uh, respectfully acknowledges the Yalakut Willen clan of the Bunwurong. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. Council has a local law which determines how this meeting is conducted and I just want to go through a few of the aspects first. Uh, there's a time allotted in tonight's agenda for public question time. Questions. This is about questions. And during public question time, a member of the public can ask specific questions on planning matters other than those relating to the topics that is on the agenda tonight. There's also a, an opportunity for members of the public to ask a question or make a comment on a specific item in tonight's agenda. I consider that's going to be your special time. Uh, this will be done prior to the committee considering an item. So when we get to an item, first of all, we'll ask members of the community to make their contribution. If you wish to ask a question or speak to a report, please complete the blue form that's available at the table just outside the chamber and hand it to a staff member. I encourage you to try to limit your questions and comments to around three minutes and try to avoid repeating any points that have been previously made by other speakers. Even if you really, really agree with them, please don't feel the need to repeat them. Let's assume we got them the first time. Please note that this committee can only address questions and deal with items within its delegation. So this is a delegated committee of, of council. That is planning matters. And the decisions of this committee are final and can be acted upon. Please note that all planning committee, committee meetings are now being live streamed. Up oh, there's the cameras. Um, Live streaming and recording allows the community to watch and listen to meetings in real time, providing greater access to council decision making and debate, and hopefully improving openness and transparency. The live stream of this meeting is available on council's website and the recording of this meeting will also be available to view a few days after the meeting on council's website and YouTube. The council will film and luckily record councillors at this meeting. However, care is taken not to um, film, uh, uh, record images of, or me of members of the public. If a member of the public asks a question or makes a comment about an agenda item, they will not be filmed. But their voice will be heard in the live stream and recorded. Please note, in accordance with Council's local law, that this meeting cannot be filmed or audio taped unless permission is granted by the Chair. In the unlikely event of an emergency evacuation, please follow the instructions of the Chief Warden. There will be someone running around with a plastic helmet on. So let's go to the first agenda item, which is apologies. Council, councillors, do we have any apologies? Madam Mayor? Um, thank you, Chair. We have three councillors that are away at the moment on leave. Yes, and I understand Councillor that. Bond, Councillor Copsey and Councillor Simic. And are you happy to move I'm those? I'm happy to move that. And uh, is there a second to Councillor Baxter? Um, all those in favour? The motion is carried unanimously. Uh, agenda item two is minutes of the previous meeting. Councillors, the minutes of the planning committee meeting held on the 24th of October have been uh, circulated. They are here if anyone wants to um, uh, inspect them. Are there any questions in relation to these minutes? If not, can I have a motion to confirm these minutes? Moved uh, Madam Mayor, seconded Councillor Baxter. I'll now put the motion, all those in favour, carried unanimously. Declarations of conflicts of interest. Does any councillor have a conflict of interest in a matter being discussed at tonight's meeting? There be none. I go across to public question time. Councillors, um, there are no questions tonight, so we can go to councillor question time. Councillors, are there any questions of the officers? Agenda item five. 
There are none. Um, I'll now move to agenda item six, which is presentation of reports. Um, so let's go to agenda item 6.1, which is 270 Beaconsfield Parade, Middle Park. Councillors, we have two people, uh, uh, for, uh, two requests from the members of the public to speak to this item. Uh, can I ask uh, Linda Sloan? Yes, please sit in there. We colloquially call that the seat of truth. And um, <laughs> good on you, Linda. Um, so I'll ask you and and thank you. And I'll ask you, Ms. Sloan, and everyone else to um, uh, state your name and suburb for the record. My name is Linda Sloan. And I'm here in regard to 270 Beaconsfield Parade, Middle Park. Great. We um, give everyone uh, three minutes, but there's a little bit of latitude there, but we ask you to start now. I want to begin by saying this property has been in my family for the past 50 years. And I go out of my way to ensure that our tenants are happy, always. It's very important to me. Flats 1 and 3 adjoining 270 Beaconsfield Parade will be severely impacted if this development goes ahead as they're requesting. Overshadowing is a huge concern. The three exhaust rises are opposite our four bedrooms at the rear. If they are necessary, let them go on the McGregor Street side, away from our families, if they must be placed somewhere. 270 was a heritage listed property and still has heritage features of the original property, which complements the area. The height is above the default 11 metre height allowance, which is unacceptable due to the overwhelming bulk. The proposed site is 89%, which exceeds res code standards. It is far too close to the side boundaries and existing windows. A variation to A14 is unacceptable. Our entrance from McGregor Street is part of our yard and is certainly not just a pathway. Compare, compare, compared to properties from McGregor Street to Langridge Street block, the front is too far forward, which is not in keeping with the character of the area. Our tenants' quality of life will be seri seri severely impacted, both in the verandas and the balconies in front, and also the recreation area in the yard. There are other things I could have written, but I tried to keep it short as possible. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Um, Councillors, any questions? Yeah, there's uh, the applicant too. Thanks very much. Thank you. Will I go back now or do I wait here? Oh, could you resume your seat and sure. we'll get the Thank applicant you. to talk to us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Alexandra Wade. Good evening, councillors. Uh, did you wish for me to state address and details? Yep. Um, so my name is Alexandra Wade. I'm here on behalf of the applicant and I'm from Ratio Consultants, which resides out of Gwen Street in Cremorne. Thank you. This proposal is to construct a single family home on the site. We have sought to work collaboratively with council throughout the process, attending several... Sorry. Maybe just higher, that's better. Um, attending several meetings with council, council's urban designer and council's heritage advisor to facilitate an outcome with council's planning officers we are supportive of. We sought to formally amend plans after advertising to satisfy outstanding concerns and have been liaising with council regarding further conditions proposed on the planning permit. 
We have now reached a point where we've had agreement from the proposed design and building envelope with council officers and various internal departments. The proposal seeks to develop the land with a suitable building envelope to satisfy the client's needs whilst responding appropriately to council and objections received. The dwelling has been designed by an award-winning architect, which will provide a great example of modern architecture within the streetscape. With respect to the impacts of number 271 Birkinsville Parade, we note that the adjoining apartments have been designed to have their primary outlook to the bay and to the rear of the site, with windows facing side boundaries purely having a daylight and ventilation function. The proposed setbacks match and exceed the setbacks of the adjoining property, which on the adjoining property is 1.4 metres. There are no habitable room windows facing towards number 271 Beaconsfield Parade, which would result in unreasonable overlooking. A condition of the permit is proposed also to require the lobby window on the second floor adjacent to 271 to be appropriately screened. The area to the rear of 271 Beaconsfield Parade is a concrete communal area, which is primarily used for clothes drying, motorcycle, bicycle parking and bin storage. In relation to the exhaust rises that were raised by the adjoining property owner, we note that they're located behind a parapet wall, so they will be screened and not visible from the adjoining property. We also note that any noise will need to comply with SEPN requirements in relation to residential dwelling uses. We agree with the officer's comments that the proposed setbacks are appropriate in this location. Thank you very much. Please feel free to um, resume your seat unless there are any questions, councillors. Thanks. Councillors, are there any questions of the officers? Councillor Brand. I'd like to take up with officers some um, questions are, uh, raised by Ms Sloan, um, just to go over some of them um, about setbacks and locations and what have you, just for so we can be sure of our position. Can you comment on the, on the uh, location of the exhaust rises and what governs their location um, uh, in relation to the next door property? <coughs> Through you Mr Chairman, um, I'll, um, I'll let Mr Beard um, talk to the specifics of the setbacks and so forth, but um, I might premise his comments by um, raising the point that um, this, the subject site is quite narrow, so the, um, as, it, as is the neighbouring site at 271, um, Beaconsfield Parade, which uh, means there is a constraint in how developments can be built on these, these sites. Um, full compliance with res code setbacks couldn't be achieved um, and still um, achieve an adequate um, area of floor space on these sites. Um, that's in the context of both the design and development overlay and the residential zone, both um, providing for buildings of up to five storeys. And as you know, there's, um, the application before you is for three, so it's well below what could potentially be built on the site. Um, in terms of the interface with 271, there's a number of issues that need to be taken into consideration, and one is um, one has been touched on by the applicant that the um, the side setback um, of the neighbouring property is of a, of a similar width, or in fact slightly less. Um, it is a, a functional space; it provides for access and um, and storage and so forth, and it's not what we would consider to be um, open space to the residents. Um, a relevant factor also is that the habitable room windows facing that boundary, sorry, there are virtually no habitable room windows facing that boundary. Those um, windows' primary function is um, for, for daylight and for uh, ventilation, but um, most of those windows are non-habitable room windows such as bathrooms and toilets, etc. cetera. And, um, and also a relevant factor is that the, the wall on the, uh, the current wall on the boundary um, is is um, of the existing building is um, whilst not as uh, not extending as far into the site is um, almost of the same height as what's being proposed here. So um, the the exhaust um, rises are uh, mechanical equipment for air conditioning and so forth, and it's um, no different to placing air conditioning units on the roof of, of any. Uh, commercial, sorry, residential property, um, but located at the very back of the site, and I, um, 
and it, in the floor plan you'll see that it's in the back um, right hand corner uh, but enclosed within a parapet wall so they would not be visible from neighbouring um, properties and not um, extending beyond the back of the dwelling on the neighbouring property. So I might hand over at this point to uh, Mr Beer to discuss the, um, the setback requirements. Well, through the chair, the setback, the site is a corner site. So if you're talking, councillor, about the front setback, the streetscape setback, mm -hmm. which I presume you are. Well, and the side ones, but... Well, as Mr Schuster well, said, Mr. Schuster, yeah. the, the side ones, as outlined in the report, don't comply with the, the wedding cake setback that Res Code proposes. The front setback... Can I just ask yes. you on that? And the existing building? No, the existing building is set back closer to the side boundary than the proposed one. And the, so it doesn't comply with the res code no, either? Okay. No, the existing, the existing building is set back just over a metre from the side walkway that has been mentioned. Uh, aside from the ground level, the proposed building would be set back 1.7 metres. Councillor Brown, through the chair, all questions? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the front setback, the neighbouring building uh, has a protruding central feature, which is set back, <coughs> pardon me, about 1.6 metres from Beaconsfield Parade, uh, and it has a, a two recessed features. The one that's closest to the subject site is set back about four and a half metres from Beaconsfield Parade. That's visible on the ground floor plan. The proposal at the direct interface would match that four and a half metre setback of the, of the uh, recessed neighbouring feature, whilst the rest of it would be set back further from the boundary by about a metre than the protruding feature at the neighbouring property at 271. That would continue onto the, s the first floor. The second floor, the uppermost level, would be set back about seven and a half metres from the front boundary, all of which are, uh, all of which match or, or exceed the, the setback requirements. It's really only the side setbacks there where significant variations are being sought, but as Mr Schuster has pointed out, it's a difficult, constrained site with the, the narrowness of it. Um, through you, Mr Chair. Um, the exhaust risers, the, they may be invisible, but what is the... Is there any expectation about the exhaust? I, I, it's, I'm just not familiar with exhaust risers being a common feature of residential buildings, and maybe maybe I'm wrong, but no, certainly no, look, air conditioning things I understand. But again, look through the chair. Normally, I, I've not seen this treatment before. Uh, I'm presuming and led to understand that they are for ventilation of the garage, and there's various pieces of plant equipment in there, but. There are the cars there as well. There's no planning control over their function. It's really just a visual matter and they would be invisible. But they've been pushed as far to the back of the property as they could be. And another question. Um, overshadowing. Uh, how, does this, how does the overshadowing of this compare to the existing building and to the res code requirements? Well, again, as through the chair stated in the report, it's, there are variations to the, the standard, but uh, in terms of the impact on that side walkway, if we don't include the rear paved, hard paved area at number 271 as open space, if we just talk about the side walkway, it, the, there would be a variation from the standard, but only from about midday onwards, and compared to the original or the current shadowing, it would be an imperceptible difference. From about that time onwards, that sideway would be in shadow, currently and proposed. Thank you very much. Councillor Voss. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to ask a question potentially to Mr Borg um, around the recommendation that we've got in front of us and about the item that's headed permit notes and I'm um, just wondering if I can have some commentary around that, whether that should be... Is that still recommended to be in the recommendation? 
through you, Mr Chairman. Um, I understand that um, Councillor Boss is referring to uh, permit notes at page six, moving on to page seven of the agenda. So it's um, the fourth dot point in item D, which makes reference to no resident or visitor parking permits. Now that is, uh, that is incorrect, that should not be part of the um, recommendation. So if councillors have a mind to support the officer recommendation, um, I would recommend deleting that dot point from the resolution. Thanks very much, Mr. Ball. Any any further questions? Uh, I might ask the officers. I don't know who should um, answer this. the The proposal is quite a um, large and confronting design to some tastes. What would your commentary be on that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I wouldn't make a commentary, but I would rely on expert advice from our urban designers and, um, and our heritage advisor, both of which have supported the design. I, um, I understand that the, um, the architect is um, held in high regard and has uh, many examples of fine architecture in this municipality, and um, I trust that the end result will be a good one. Councillors, are there any further questions? Councillor Voss? Um, thank you. I'd just like to ask a question around the uh, significant piece of wall on the boundary. Um, typically, uh, it's encouraged that um, the developments are more articulated and that there isn't that sort of vast um, wall. I'm just wondering how that complies with how we normally um, would like to see our buildings. Thank you, Mr Schuster. Uh, through the Chair, I'm just clarifying, is that to McGregor Street, the side street frontage? Well, again, I've relied on the advice from the internal experts. However, having said that, there are some changes required to that wall so that it doesn't appear in part as high. There's a section that originally was 2.1 metres high. That's to come down to uh, 1.8, essentially form a fence with a heavy, significant reveal behind. Uh, and the section approaching the garage door leading towards the, the single storey house is to have a, a ref or much more overtly and strongly reference the brick uh, pattern and the brick character of the, 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 the more of the cladding in McGregor Street. The blank nature of the wall towards the front is a matter of design and as I say it's it's been resolved to a satisfactory extent is probably as much as I could say. So the wall would be divided into three segments. The one closest to Beaconsfield Parade would be the blankest but it's been resolved in relation to the whole of that facade to the best extent we could achieve. Councillors, if we have um, no further questions, do we have a, uh, uh, a motion? I'm happy to move the officer's recommendation in the absence um, taking into account the deletion of the note referred to by Councillor Voss, which is um, the permit note uh, D, uh, D, is that correct? Last dot point. Is there a seconder for that? Uh, seconded Councillor Voss. Um, I'll reserve my right. To close. Do, uh, Councillor Brand, do you wish, oh, Councillor Voss, do you wish to speak to it? I'll reserve my right to. Councillor Brand? Uh, yes, look, um, I will be supporting this uh, recommendation. Um, uh, I need to say I take the, um, the comments and the plea from the from Ms Sloan, the, the owner of the neighbouring property, seriously, and I can understand why it'll, it would be alarming to see this 
um, proposal sort of beside you. Um, but I do think when it comes down to it, and having grilled the officers yet again on the same issues, um, that it is really not very different from what is there already and less than what could be there. Um, given uh, the design and development overlay in the area which contemplates taller buildings than this, uh, it, that, that does in effect mean that it contemplates um, breaches of the everyday use of, uh, of, of the res code setbacks and what have you, what you would find in the, in the suburb, applied to the suburb behind it, but Beaconsfield, is a, Beaconsfield Parade is a, an exceptional place with its own exceptional um, uh, design and development overlay and expectations and requirements. Um, Look, it's it's strange. It's not a it, it's it's not a building that appeals to me hugely, but it is by a, a, a designer who I respect deeply, um, and I think that Beaconsfield Parade is a very particular uh, and special place. It is marked by um, from one length to the other buildings of every era that uh, uh, that do something special and and idiosyncratic in the city of Port Phillip. They are there right along this foreshore, craning their necks, looking at this great, fantastic view, this beautiful view across the water. And every building in its own way, not well, every major building, every important building in its own way along Beaconsfield Parade of every era has this sort of exuberance and uh, <coughs> desire to be by the sea, the desire to have big glass windows, balconies that are there expressing this valuation of being there. Um, and being, you know, maybe a bit over the top. Um, I think they're over, over the top buildings of every era and I think that's part of the heritage and part of the character of the street. This building, I think, is, is doing it. I think that we're lucky at the moment that we've probably got three or four or five buildings of this era which are going to do the same thing like this along Beaconsfield Parade and add to that uh, tradition there and most of the ones of this era are, are actually a little bit gaudy, I reckon, a little bit showy-offy, and I think it's the right place for that as, as well anyway. I think it's part of the character. So really, I'm, I'm you know, I, I think it's not going to please everybody's eyes, but I think that we are doing something which is respects uh, the spirit of Beaconsfield Parade and will enhance it over the years from now on, so I'm supporting this. Well, Spoken, I'll, I'll have my contribution now. I want to talk about two issues. The first issue is the question of demolition. Usually in this pace, I'm very reluctant to demolish anything, but the level of alteration is so profound and so diminishes the building that's being demolished that I, uh, I have no hesitation in supporting demolition. The next question is the nature of the design and uh, Councillor Brand made a, a really fantastic adumbration of the, uh, the design uh, qualities of Beaconsfield Parade. Uh, what I would say to Ms Sloan is that you live in a beautiful place and I understand your reluctance to embrace a building that's very different and very confronting. Um, nonetheless, it complies and this is a place where we have to take the advice of our experts. Sorry, um, I'm sorry, Ms Sloan, you've had your go and... Uh, I'm looking at you. I was mainly talking about the design. And with the compliance issues, they're not strict. They, are, they do take into account context and they do take into account place and Beaconsfield Parade is completely different to um, the rest of Victoria and the laws that we are dealing with have to be moder modified in relation to the fact that um, they were designed to cover all of the suburbs of, of Melbourne and Beaconsfield Parade is, is different. So I completely understand the position you're, on, you're in but I feel I'm in a position where I have to support the application. 
Councillor Voss? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can Councillor Crawford? I'm going to be quick. I think my eye for what is good design must be very different to some of our more learned colleagues. But um, I guess my thing is that I'm, I'm actually on the fence. I'm not usually a fence-sitter. Um, I probably will have to vote for this, but I did want to put on the record... You know, what I think when I drive along Beaconsfield Parade is how badly planning controls got it wrong all those years ago. And I feel like this is another building, that it may fit all the criteria, but it's, it does not respond to the place it's going in, in any shape or form. And it looks like an... It's, it's, in terms of um, the houses it's next to, the place that it is, I, I struggle to see where such a giant building that probably is more at home in the city is, is, is considered a good response to the Beaconsfield Parade. And I fear that this decision we're going to make, that I probably will vote for because it does fit in with all the um, res codes and things like that, will just add to when a future generation drives along Beaconsfield Parade and go, who let that get built? So I, and I just... I struggle to see how we allow such different responses in a place that, not that it has to be uniform, but it needs to be more responsive to the space in which it's being built. Thanks, Councillor Crawford. Are there any other speakers? Uh, I won't close. I'll now move to the vote. All in favour of the recommendation? All, all those against? Declare the motion carried. I'd now like to move on to uh, agenda item 6.2, 47 Blessington Street, St Kilda. We have one speaker in this matter, and that is from the applicant, Warren Forster. Foster. Mr Foster, hi. Good. <laughs> Tense. I'll be quick. <laughs> Uh, I've just got four points. Could I ask you to just put on the record your name yeah. and... So uh, that... I'm Warren Foster, WJFA Architects. Um, the applicant, we're representing the owner who's here today of 47 Blessington Street, uh, which is a bar, originally licensed as a general licensed bar, changed by the state government to be a restaurant <laughs> licence. OK, thank you. Oh, the application was initiated after um, Council made some compliance checks in regard to noise complaints at the premises. Um, there was a very old uh, licence uh, condition referring to music. Um, the discussions with the Council was that we should bring it in line with CEP, the uh, CEP2 NN2 uh, State Government policy for live music. Um, so an application was drafted with suggestions and help from the uh, planning, planning department of the council. Um, it has been a long and intensive uh, process. I think we've been on the, on the go for a couple of years now. Um, and part of that was trying, trying to address a lot of concerns of objectors in the area, uh, a lot of back and forwards with the neighbours. Um, but the owner has looked at the conditions that have been uh, put forward by the planning officer. Um, the owner fully supports those conditions and actually commends the planning officer's report. Um, they're looking forward to the conditions and noise meter that's been, uh, that's been uh, proposed um, as they believe it will provide an accurate measure for them to control not only the, the music at the venue but any future complaints that might arise. Thanks very much, Mr Foster. Um, councillors, any questions? Councillor Brand? Could I ask Mr Foster just to describe the functioning of the airlock door yep. to the backyard area and how that's going to work and any difficulties? Yeah, well, there's, um, it needs... We need to sort of... There's an existing veranda there which at the moment doesn't have a lined ceiling or walls. So we've got to provide new walls, which are all sealed, and a secondary door. There's already one door in that, out to that space. Um, we've looked at, we've had a JTA report, and the, who are recommending the, obviously the seals and that required. Um, so that, 
the, the airspace in between will also service a toilet off that area. So um, we've, we've had a, a look. It is a very tight space. Um, the, the rear area is required by smoking laws at this stage. So um, the airlock that we've come up with has been checked by JTA, who, who said it will work. So we're taking that, their advice on that. Just uh, how, how is the thing going to function? Oh, well, it has to actually have closes on both doors. Yep. Yeah. Councillor Voss. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'd like to ask a question that's not a particular planning matter, yep. but I'm wondering, um, since you're in contact with the, with the owner, yep. um, whether you could speak on behalf of the owner, and that's around uh, a large community concern regarding cigarette butts and smoking. Mm. So um, a lot of the residents would have a problem because people go outside and they talk. Yep. When they when they smoke, yeah. um, so I think that issue um, is resolved as far as it can be. But yeah. I guess one of the residual concerns is that the cigarette butts are then left on the street, and just wondering um, if there could be a commitment. I know it's outside the planning scheme yeah. here, but whether there oh. could be a commitment by um, the owner yeah. to make sure that those cigarette butts are yeah. cleaned up every day. It's all right. Can uh, can I have one minute? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> the owner said they have supplied a, a uh, smoking receptacle out there, which is brought in every night at the end of the shift. Um, the staff are meant to sweep the not only the footpath in that area, but, I mean, obviously there's a few cars left there. They can't get to that stage. But, um, you know, it's a very narrow sort of footway there. And I know there was some proposal maybe a while ago to widen that, make it a bit more pedestrian-friendly. But um, if there's any cigarettes out into the car park and they can reach it, they also sweep that area. They make a uh, commitment to do that, continue that as part of their their um, staff policy. So I'm not sure, you know, at that precinct, they're right on the very edge of the precinct, so it's a bit hard how far you go up the road. And, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. That's really important to the health of our bay, so yep. I appreciate that <laughs> no commitment. Thank you. Yeah. Councillors, any questions? Councillor Brown? Yes, I just had one more question about the airlock. At the, yeah. Can you just describe the, 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 the issue of when it's open and when it's not, and what happens when it's closed? If, if both doors are open at the same time? You well, I, understand, well then I, I, I believe they're not meant to be. That, no. That when, oh, no, sorry. When, yeah. No, they, of course they can be when there's no music, but when there's music... There was a suggestion, I think, in the report, I'd have to refer to Philip... Um, about whether that rear door could be locked when the music was on. The problem, it sends people back out the front to smoke. Um, so it might create a bigger issue that, that, um, that Councillor Voss was just talking about. So I'm not sure whether, whether, the, whether the, the recommendations from the planners were to actually to lock that door when music's on. But both doors would be fitted with closers, so, I mean, in the event that you'd had someone opening one door and opening the other door, there might be a small moment that we're assuming the closers would bring the doors closed, as in a traditional airlock. And it's fully sealed airlock. Thanks very much. Any further questions? Do I have a resolution? Councillor Poole? Happy to move the officer's recommendation. Chair. Thanks very much. Seconded by Councillor Baxter. Um, do you wish to speak? I'll speak at the end if that's right. Councillor Baxter, do you wish to speak? I'll, I'll just speak briefly. It, uh, it certainly seems like a, a sensible um, uh, motion from the, the officers here. 
uh, a minor change here, but with big ramifications, which seem to have been taken care of. Councillor Brand? I, I feel a little sceptical about whether this is going to work, but I think so much effort has been put into making it work, <laughs> and so many concessions have been made, I think, on the applicant's side for the type of music and the, um, not that I think they're bad choices, but just <laughs> they are things that, that have been agreed to, which, yep. will, be, which will limit yep. the scope of things. And it's, you know, they've gone so far, if this doesn't work, it's very hard to see how small places are going to be able to operate mm. in a situation like that. It is a very sensitive interface yeah. between, you know, a tiny little bit of commercial uh, um, zone and a lot of residential. Uh, we'll look to see how this works, and uh, mm. this is this is our best shot at making a difficult, a really difficult and sensitive situation actually work. Yeah. Um, so I hope it's all done really well, to the best of everybody's ability, and people mm. go the extra mile wherever well, possible. Well, we are trusting that. Sorry. We get to lecture. Oh, you. so I was going to say we are trusting that the airlock is yeah. set up right. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Pearl, do you wish to close? <laughs> it wasn't on before. Um, yeah, I think um, Councillor Baxter, Councillor Brand have said most of it. I would say um, this is a good balance between two and it's a charming group of shops which oh. uh, hopefully these type of uh, permits and arrangements will in, uh, enhance the character and bring a new generation of people to that area. So in 20, 30 years' time, these small little alterations to these uh, tenancies ensure that um, the place remains vibrant. I wish you all the very best in terms of the reconfiguration of um, this. And uh, well done to the applicant, well done to the officers, and not to say that the objectors' considerations haven't been taken into account. I think they have, but I think the balance here is, uh, is a terrific outcome. Happy to support it. Thanks very much, Councillor Poole. I'll move to the vote now. All those in favour? Clearly carried. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Let's move on now to agenda item 6.3, 3 Rainsford Street, Elwood. We have three, uh, two speakers on this matter. The first is an objector, uh, Dana Thane. Good evening, councillors. Hi. Could I Hello, ask you to you? repeat your name and your suburb, please? My name is Dana Thane and I live in Elwood. <coughs> Your time starts now. All right. I'm just going to put the stopwatch on. It's OK. I've got mine running. OK. I'm uh, objecting to a, a rather rapacious and overly ambitious... Uh, project at 3 Rainsford Street and also in a very strong manner objecting to uh, removal of the Canary Island date palm. Uh, apparently it's been suggested that the palm tree can be removed if it's donated to the council and I would tend to suggest that that is not the way that the council has acted in the past. I think that would be very unwise and I think it would set a very dangerous precedent about uh, giving trees to council so you can remove them off private property because it is a significant tree. It, you do need a permit. Generally, the permits are issued if the tree is diseased. Then council will say, OK, this tree is diseased. Or, uh, in this case, the tree is very, very, very healthy. A couple of other reasons they might issue a permit to remove a significant tree would be that the, uh, there is some uh, federal or state or even local infrastructure. Then they would issue a permit to remove the tree. There was a recently, uh, I'm sure you're aware, uh, there was a, uh, an old medical centre on the corner of Byron Street and Brighton Road. Now, this is the precedent. So uh, they want to build a childcare centre. Guy next door was very upset about it, very upset about it indeed. So uh, what happened was there's a huge tree at the back. 
they managed, they left the tree there, they pulled the whole medical centre down, which was just like a very, very large house in Elwood. They demolished it and they managed to save the tree. And, and I put it to you, councillors, from the bottom of my heart, I beg you, please save the tree. Please leave it where it is. It has been in that street for a very, very, very long time. And if you Google, if you go onto Google Maps, uh, you will see a very pleasant and simple photograph uh, of, of the house and of the tree. And also, it doesn't seem to be equitable that you, if this house was in Albert Park or if this house was in uh, Middle Park, it would be heritage listed. Uh, that also, uh, there is a, a special building overlay, which is in the purview of... Uh, Melbourne Water, uh, the setback from the frontage is four metres. So the tree is easily within that setback. So I think it would take uh, some architectural flair and uh, some imagination uh, because basically they just want to build a three-storey block of flats. That's what they want to do. And there's number five, there's number seven, uh, those flats, they leave their rubbish bins out. The pavement is very, very narrow. Uh, they leave them out for days on end. We're gonna, and so when these new four flats go in, we're going to have the same problem. It will put a lot of pressure on that. Uh, and it makes it especially difficult for elderly and infirm pe people tra to traverse along the pavement, along that side of the street, on a rubbish day or just a couple of days after a waste management collection. Uh, so basically, uh, I would like council to save this very historic building. Four minutes. Uh, I would very much like council to reject the offer of the tree and uh, preserve its status as a significant tree and leave it in situ in beautiful Rainsford Street, Elwood. It is a, an amazing part of the street. The whole street will die if you remove that uh, tree. It's very much part of the skyline. It's beautiful, it's perfect, and it's iconic of the city of St Kilda and the city of Elwood. Very, very iconic. I beg you from the bottom of my heart, please save the tree at 3 Rainsford Street, Elwood. Thank, Thank you. Thanks very much, Darren. You're welcome. You're welcome. Oh, I go back, do I? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I was enjoying it up there. Thank you for listening. <laughs> uh, for the record, Mr Chairman, uh, Trevor Ludeman, Project Planning Development, Planning Consultant from uh, Blackburn. Uh, we obviously agree with the uh, recommendation of the officer in this, in this particular instance. Um, this has been a long time coming. I think we were here about probably 12 months ago uh, where the application had gone right throughout the whole advertising process with no objections received. And then the urban designer came back with their comments about redesigning the proposal. So it went from a five unit proposal to a four. Uh, it was redesigned in accordance with the urban designer's uh, opinion and we've had to run the gauntlet of going back through the advertising process all over again. Nonetheless, as you've, been, as you've alluded to earlier on in the conversation today, is that yes, you've got suburban type res code standards that apply right across the suburban metropolitan Melbourne and in, even on this site here you'll find that this design of four units does comply with those requirements in terms of permeability, site coverage, etc. So in terms of what the design has done here is a very considered response. Um, it's only four, four dwellings on this particular site. So we agree with basically the officer's recommendation. Thanks very much, Mr Ludeman. Oh, sorry, Mr Ludeman. C Councillor Brand wants to... Um... Have a question? Yes, you, you. Uh, It's a question. Um, I'm just trying to find the part of the recommendation that it refers, that refers to it, but I'm just wondering, just as a matter of interest, there, there's a, there is a, um, 
a recommended condition that affects the, f the dining room window at the front on the first floor. Maybe an officer could just say what it is. Condition 1F. Condition 1F, is it? First floor north facing dining room window to unit 1, deleted and replaced with windows that match the first floor facing windows living room to unit 1. Does that, how does your architect, have, does your architect have any, does your architect have any uh, problem with that? No, no. Issue? The architects had a look at these conditions and they're, they're fine with those changes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just want to know that. Councillors, if there are no further questions, do we have a... Sorry? You've got a question of the officers. Yeah. Councillor Crawford? So I just wanted to clarify a couple of things, if I may. Um, I do know that some of the issues raised are more amenity risk issues like garbage um, bins being returned in a timely manner, which is, you know, the inner city about getting people to behave properly in, in close quarters. I just wanted to clarify with the tree. So that tree will come to us um, and have we at this point nominated where that tree will go or is that still are we looking to find somewhere nearby in the neighbourhood or how would that process go? Through you, Mr Chair. The process would be that there's a requirement at condition 19 for an arborist report to be provided which details how the tree would be saved. And it would be at the discretion of Council's Parks and Gardens Department as to where the tree would be located. So Councilor could Crawford? you clarify for me um, if it is a significant tree which we can move, but in usual situations, do we not try to maintain significant trees on, on sites? And, and why this time we feel we can move it? Uh, there's a, there's a uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. There's a there's a couple of matters to consider. Um, one is that there would be some replacement landscaping, um, which would be a curated response to the streetscape. The there's a there's a a dearth of um, manicured um, curated landscaping in the street. There's a landscape plan that forms part of the application material which will, will improve the um, public realm in terms of landscaping. Um, the other aspect is that these types of trees are, one, are, are a species that lend themselves to relocation. They have a shallow root system um, and they can be uh, efficiently transplanted in circums if th if this was if this was a a indigenous tree it, we might be it might be a different situation um, having said that though indigenous trees can often lose their branches and, and be a danger public health risk if it were uh, an exotic tree there at that was significant then there would perhaps be issues around um, whether or not council is of an opinion that though, that that tree should be should be kept, um, and we would be we would rely on the advice from our arborist. Thank you. I'd like to ask a question th to the planners um, around the precedent that this will set in relation to significant trees being able to be removed any time someone wants to do a bigger development on their site. Um, so what do you say about that precedent being set that someone wants to do a bigger development so they can give their tree to council? Um, for you, Mr Chair, um, as has been mentioned previously, planning is not a jurisdiction of um, precedent. But look, the essence here is that the arborist response has been this is an either or situation. Um, there is an option to retain a tree or relocate a tree 
in their response to the officers. Um, and um, as Mr Spencer has said, it's one of the... Uh, it is a species that has that um, uh, optional nature to it. So um, trees are relocated um, in the, a number of cases. Uh, in fact, a lot of the, the palm trees that exist in Port Phillip are, have actually come from other municipalities at different times, um, been acquired from different locations. It's, it's not... Um, it's not an exceptional situation. Councillor Voss. Um, thank you. So what would we need to do, should we be of a mind, to keep this optional significant date palm at, in this location? For you, Mr Chair, a condition, um, an alternative uh, condition um, as part of any recommendation could... Uh, require the tree to be retained as part of the development. Thank you. Would the development need to change? Was it, there's still four metres in the front yard, I understand? For you, Mr Chair, it's the opinion of the arborist that the tree could be retained in that four metres. Uh, just uh, the... I believe the... I can't remember where it was, but in the report, I think it did say that uh, retention of that tree would require a redesign of the, uh, a significant redesign of the of the application. So uh, I'm not sure which is the case. It would be fine, or it wouldn't be fine. Mr Ball, can you help us with this? Through you, Mr Chair, Mr Chairman, uh, Councillor Baxter is correct. It does say that at page 93 that uh, significant changes would be required to the design development, um, including changes to access arrangements, an increase in the front setback of the development by at least two metres. Um, and there's a statement there about... The Sorry, that's two, two, two metres two met in addition to the four metres. That's correct. Can, can I also add, um, certainly to Mr Guthridge and Mr Spencer's comments, is that um, this, uh, I think, uh, a situation like this is exceptional. I've been here 11 years. I've, this condition has never been put on a permit previously, so it's not something we would do, you know, um, uh, willy-nilly. It's something we would think about, and it can be relocated. There's opportunities for that. So, the other thing we've always got to remember is the significance of trees is only its only strength is through the local law. That doesn't override the planning scheme provision, which is a state control. So, it is about a matter of balancing the outcomes. And in this case, we get to keep a tree and also provide some um, very good landscaping to the rest of the development. So I'm just I'm just trying to get clarification about um, uh, Council Voss's questions about you know what what's to stop anybody doing this. So is it the case that because the arborist uh, report has said you can either leave it or move it because it's a pretty movable tree? Is that basically what this whole thing is hinging on? And therefore, if it wasn't that kind of tree, that that would be preventing. You know anybody from moving? I mean, I'm just trying to clarify. Is that what we're talking about? It's just that there's this particular kind of tree because it's very mobile, or through you, Mr. Chair, um, that is really the essence of it. It is, it is a species of tree where they have provided an option in their response. And just a follow-up question. Um, I know you're, you're not an arborist, but um, it would an arborist report on most other types of trees. Uh, it probably wouldn't say the you can take it or leave it because a lot of trees aren't as mobile as as this, in a very broad sense. For you, Mr Chair, I believe that's the case. Councillor Crawford, do you have your follow-up question? <laughs> Councillor Brand? Can I get a clarification of this? When the arborist says the tree could 
could re remain there, um, do they mean with the exact same development on site or a development with one less apartment on it? Because obviously if you didn't do the development at all, the tree could stay there. Um, it's, what, 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 is, I mean, what is meant by the... What, what do you think the arborists actually meant when they said that, would, that, that it could survive there with this particular development in this, in this format or a, a, a changed one? Would it need to change? Through you, Mr Chair, my understanding of the arborist response is that it, 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 I, I've done a, an assessment myself in terms of putting the location of the tree on the, develop, on the development plans. And what that does is it impacts on the driveway. Um, the, the trunk of the tree would nudge the edge of the driveway and the driveway is reasonably tight as it is. That's a ground floor. At, at first floor, it would, um, it would cut into the balcony, would mean the whole balcony would go at first floor and also part of the dining room. At, at the second floor, all of the upper level balcony would need to be removed. So it would, well, the, sorry, the, uh, the north, the northern half of it, north eastern half of it. Councillor Crawford. I have a recall. Um, so could I address this to Mr Borg? So you're, given that the, it's only local laws that protect our significant trees, you're suggesting that if it went to VCAT, it would not be able to be saved and that by conditioning it in this way, we can save the tree by moving it, that it would not necessarily survive if, um, you know, if, we, if there was to be a challenge. If we said, no, we want you to adjust the design and went to VCAT, we wouldn't be able to save it given it's only local laws. The question VCAT would look at is what's the alternative? And that's one of the things that they would certainly look at. We have provided, uh, and the applicant has offered, uh, an excellent alternative condition in, in that situation. One of the difficulties we have with the trees and the tree controls we have is we don't actually have vegetation protection overlays. That's what gives strength to trees and the retention of trees. We don't have them. Uh, I think we've got one or two examples uh, in the municipality and they're actually in parks. So that's where your, your main strength is. In this situation, um, we have tried to compromise and tried to negotiate outcomes. That's, that's the strength we do at the, through the pre-application process. In this situation, again, we have a, a condition that I think VCAT would accept. Councillor Baxter? Um, I just, uh, in terms of the, um, the replacement trees, I believe they're um, ornamental plum trees or something like that. So uh, I believe the, um, or someone said that they're, that they're a response to the street and the interface with the street. So uh, how many of them are going in and um, how will that make that better, I guess? Through you, Mr Chair, um, there would be four medium-sized trees along the, along, the front, um, along the front fence and various grasses and shrubs. And if you compare the, if you compare the, the, the proposed landscaping to this site to other properties in the street, this represents a far better outcome than what exists nearby. Noting that I mean, two doors down there's a two point well, about a two metre high solid fence with some landscaping only barely visible above it and that's a, a recent development. Thanks Mr Spencer. I'm interested in getting to um, a resolution on this but uh, Councillor Voss. No, I'm still concerned about the tree chair. Um, have we got a picture up here of the actual property? At all, I've been waiting for it to come up. Um, I'm looking at it on Google Maps and I can see the um, trunk of the tree. To me, it looks like it's two metres in from uh, the driveway, so which would the current driveway there. So just wanted to um, 
Can you see that? It's away from the driveway. A fair way away from the driveway currently. It's very interesting what's on the screen. <laughs> Um, so my point is that if the driveway on the map is on on the plans is so narrow that it would you know compromise the driveway, it doesn't look like it on the picture we're seeing. So I'm just wondering what analysis that we've actually done to try and keep that tree. It seems like we're tr actively trying to get rid of it. Through you, Mr Chair, I could hand up these plans where the tree is actually plotted on the plans, which will give you an indication as to um, how it will compromise the development, if that's appropriate. Yeah, if we could pass those around, I think that would be uh, helpful. If we could start with the Mayor. Able to explain through you, Chair, what this map is, picture is? So the location and dimensions of the tree um, were lifted from the land survey plan that was provided as part of the application material and transposed onto the development plans. The, the tree is marked on those plans in yellow. That's correct. The trunk isn't isn't shown there, but the uh, the extent of the canopy is. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, Councillor Poole. Uh, I understand there's no heritage overlay of this specific site, but I'm wondering what uh, heritage value, in Council's opinion, that the existing dwelling uh, provides, albeit it doesn't have any official protections? Good question. It's, uh, uh, through Mr. Mr Chair, um, I was looking at the history of the site recently and, and the street and number, there's, there's a recent development number seven, Rainsford Street. Now that site, that, that development was approved I think in around 2003. Before it was constructed, Council did a heritage um, study of the area and number, number seven was, um, there, was a, there was an interim heritage overlay placed on that site, just for that site at number seven. The Applicant was then forced to go back to the tribunal to, um, well, had to apply to demolish the dwelling at number, at number seven. Council refused that application to demolish the, the dwelling. And the, the applicant took that application to the tribunal, council's refusal to the tribunal, and the tribunal found that the they found in the applicant's favour that it wasn't um, worthy of protection, essentially. And that was a very, it was a very similar uh, building to what's at number three. However, it did have more of its original features. Councillor Pearl. Sorry, what year was that in? I think it was roughly in 2003, but um, I... I I'm not 100% sure on the date. Councillor Pearl. And in 2018, if a survey was done again on that street, would, in Council's opinion, uh, number seven and number five be protected in some way, shape or form? Well, number seven certainly wouldn't because there's a three-storey build, building on there. Um, but um, If it was still there in the current form? At number, at number seven? Well, yes. And, and, number, and number three, no. I would imagine because it wasn't picked up as a significant property uh, back in the day. 
when the most recent heritage review was done of the site, of the street. Councillors, where... Um, Councillor Voss. One further question, please. Um, the landscaping at the front, um, you seem to, to be quite impressed with the um, replacement, being that if, if, the, if the, um, the date palm was to go, that you're happy with the replacement. Can you please describe what that landscape might be, or is that still to be determined? Through you, Mr Chairman, the scale of the drawing I have here um, doesn't allow me to go through the uh, to go through the, the plant schedule, unfortunately. Councillors. Okay. Can this be the last? Yes. Well, look, it is something which has cropped up, which we have not addressed, uh, uh, you know, um, turned our mind to as we might have. And I'm, I'm certainly feeling a little bit like I really want to just discuss this tree situation a bit more. And if we were of a mind to, um, to uh, uh, move a different motion, which retained the tree, I want to ask uh, um, uh, the senior officer about um, the consequences of that, of, of that uh, if we did do something like that, which would, in, which would involve changing the design of that front of the those fronts at the front of the building what the consequences would be what the bad consequences would be that we what the unintended the unintended consequences would be if we made that sort of decision through you mr chairman i'll, I'll answer that question um, council has the certainly has the power to make that decision and um, you know, I'm not an architect, so I can't tell you exactly what those changes will be, but certainly that is something that is available to you and it is something that the applicant would need to take on board. Now, whether the applicant would be prepared to continue with uh, the proposal as is or with the condition that Council could impose um, and the, whether they take that matter to VCAT is a matter for speculation, but you know, that would be the decision they would need to make. It would definitely have an impact on the design. It may shrink the development and may shrink the size of the apartments or it might even reduce it to three apartments, not four. So that would probably be where it would be. But it could retain the um, canary palm and rearrange some of the design. And just on the, the same question, but the VCAT, um, <clears throat> what might... I think it was mentioned before in some of the discussion that... that VCAT might somehow say uh, reject it, and in fact, then we couldn't keep the, then we couldn't return back to the condition of of saying, well, then you've got to move the tree. That that would be lost somehow. Is that I, I can't quite see that, but I um, through you, Mr. Chairman. Look, that is an option. So if you remove it from the from the um, uh, approval, if the councils of a mind to approve it, that yeah, that's no longer on the table. The applicant can still provide that. But um, if they're um, in a situation where they could be losing units, I'd suggest that they probably wouldn't accept that. If they if they took it to VCAT, and VCAT said it's too much of an imposition on you by council to keep the tree, would not could VCAT be in a position encouraged by council to say, but you must uh, donate it to council and have it moved? Through you, Mr Chairman, Council could incorporate that in its draft conditions to VCAT, which we normally have to provide draft conditions, whether it's an approval or a refusal. So, yes, we could put that back on. But the question is whether you're issuing a notice of decision with that condition to remove it. That's the, that, that would be the condition we would take to the tribunal if that, that occurs. The thing I would have to say, though, and reinforce again, as I said earlier, is we do not have... Um, vegetation protection overlays on this site. That's what gives it the main strength. So, you know, the otherwise the strength is through a local law which we've been able to negotiate and keep through uh, whether it's a negotiation compulsory conference or a, a VCAT hearing. So that is still available and it's certainly available as an option so to So to summarise, Mr Borg, is this fair that um, if we, if we um, reject the current application and it goes to VCAT and the applicant wins, 
the chances are we have lost the opportunity to save this tree in the um, municipality and it will be sold or, or destroyed. You're happy to... OK, so we've um, moved Councillor Crawford. That's the officer's recommendation. Do I have a seconder? I'll second it. For... Councillor Crawford. So I'm... You know, we always want to keep canopy and trees and they are so important to a municipality on so many levels, which I won't even go into. Often we make decisions on the chance to keep special conditions. We'll, we'll, we'll approve a decision so it doesn't go to VCAC and we lose that opportunity for special conditions that would make it better for either the neighbours or the community or whatever it is. And I think count fellow councillors that this might be another one of them. To take a chance to go to VCAT where we have no law that will protect that tree specifically and we lose the chance of keeping that tree somewhere in our municipality and I would cons it would be great if we could find somewhere nearby to that street or if that is at all possible, suitable for the soil, I think would be foolish. Um, <coughs> we do it for all other properties and I think I'm encouraging you to vote for the motion in order to save the tree for sure, not take a chance that VCAT might or the, the um, owner might, um, the applicant might then feel sorry for us when we've actually made their life harder is, 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 as human nature goes. It's not something I would expect. So I would ask you to support this motion in order to definitely save the tree. I'll reserve. Uh, Councillor Brand? Well, I've got to say, I'm, gonna, I'm thinking about this and I, I'm inclined to vote, I'm inclined to move an amendment to uh, retain this tree, but I'm listening to what other people say because I think what Councillor Crawford said is actually also valid. But if I could add to the uh, the discussion, my thinking for keep for for wishing to remove the tree and therefore not vote for this motion in its current form um, is that I think it's quite uh, looking at it, looking at the plan myself. I think it's quite not difficult at all to retain all four apartments on the site um, with just some slight rearrangement of, of balconies at the front, and uh, I think the, the driveway can slip past the, the tree easily enough. And, you know, if our, if our um, local laws, which declare it a significant tree, have any force in, in the context that this building is built, um, I, I think we've got to stick up for it somehow. I, um, you know, it's not, it's not compulsory for, for a development to retain um, lots and lots of things, front fences, um, we allow all sorts of changes to all sorts of things, uh, if, um, even though they're things that are not absolutely legally bound to be kept, but because they are part of the context that we deem are important to keep. And I think we can say because our local laws say that it's a significant tree, that it must be within the powers of, a plan, of our planning scheme to... Um, so that is a piece of context that this building needs to respond to and um, ask it to do so. And I also would think, even though I'm not sure, that we could put a, uh, we could put a supplementary clause either in, in a new motion or at least when you went to VCAT, if the, if the owner really arced up and wouldn't, do, wouldn't agree to retain the tree, that um, that, that would be the fallback position, that the tree would be relocated. So that's, that's my thinking at the moment. Thanks, Councillor Brand. Any other speakers? Councillor Pearl? I'm not too fussed about the tree. I think it's a uh, novel solution they've come to, albeit it does look a bit strange that the council is benefiting from the acquisition of the tree or gifting of the tree, which I'm not fully comfortable with. Community. Um, well, it's facilitated by council, so... We do that on behalf of the community, that's true. It seems a bit odd, but it seems like a, a novel way of doing it, which is reasonable. I'm more concerned about the existing dwelling that's there. I think um, there's no uh, formal case under heritage controls for the dwelling to be retained. It can be demolished, but I think... Um, I drove past it and had a look, and I think, it, uh, in my mind, it should be retained. I think the, the tree uh, will be saved under the council's recommend, the, um, council, the officer's recommendation. 
but I'm not um, currently comfortable with the de demolishment of the existing uh, dwelling, to be frank. Do you wish to speak, uh, Councillor Baxter? We're sort of going uh, back and forth over this one, but I think that I've been convinced by Councillor Brand that uh, we, and only because I, I respect Councillor Brand's design and architecture experience, that um, that it wouldn't be too unreasonable to consider a design that would incorporate the tree. Um, I'm I'm not an architect or. or in any way a design person so I, I rely on advice about these sorts of things and so I look to very smart people um, so I think that uh, and I think that Councillor Brown's reasoning is reasonably solid in that we could attempt to uh, keep the tree um, in a uh, in a revised design and then if we if the applicant didn't want to respond to that and and instead we ended up in a VCAP process, we could then attempt to save the tree within the municipality through other means that we have at our disposal. But I think the argument that um, we don't have uh, vegetation protection uh, provisions within the planning scheme, so Therefore, what do we look to when we look at um, what we want to protect? I think we look to the significant tree register. So I think I'll probably uh, not support the officer's motion and see whether we can find a way to keep the tree where it is. Is there another way of doing this? It would, a, would a, a motion of deferment, for instance, be acceptable that we might defer it and negotiate with the... Uh... Well, we could move... I mean, anybody can move another motion or... No, you can foreshadow a motion of deferment. Do you want me to ask? And that we could uh, discuss whether it was... We could discuss, instead of waiting to go to VCAT or whatever, we could go and see if it was acceptable to the client and further consider it. I'm not sure there's any value in that, but I'm just, I just want to know whether that's a possibility or perhaps whether it's a valuable possibility. Well, my understanding uh, of the law of the rules is that um, once this is, if this is defeated, it's defeated. If it succeeds, it succeeds. The question is about deferment is, um, I think it might be too, is it too late to defer now? Now that there's a... Mr Chair. Sorry. Um... Right. Someone would need to... Um, I've just been advised that someone would need to um, foreshadow a notion to defer so that this, if this resolution was lost we could still defer it and deal with it later. Excuse me, Chair, I'd be keen to understand the answer to the question that Councillor Brand put. Is there a better way? That was just one idea. OK, I'll ask Mr Borg on this. Through you, Mr Chairman, look, the, I won't say the better way, I'll say there is another way. Um, so, And the, the other way could be that you incorporate conditions and change some of the conditions in the body of the recommendation and uh, run that as an alternate uh, motion to the officer recommendation. So that would be things like you would need to include additional conditions, a condition O, the retention, something like the retention of the canary palm, P, modifications to the development as a, as a requirement of that. You would need to look at the Arbus report condition and to think about including the retention of that tree within the management component of it. And at 19, where the reference is to relocation, you'd be talking about retention. So that would be one way of doing it. We'd be doing it on the run, but we could, that's certainly something you could look at doing. 
Yeah, in condition 19, it says before the development starts, a management plan for relocation, that could be a management plan for the retention of the existing canary apartment. So there's... So that's a, another alternative that is available, including deferment. So I'm always very hesitant about um, uh, rewriting and redesigning on the run. Um, we might consider standing this matter down and then um, uh, you working on an old track. Is that acceptable? Just on a, I don't have the local law in front of me, but are you allowed to do that once a motion's been put and a second has been announced? I, uh, I think... Sorry, we've got to deal the with the motion. motion's been put, right? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, we've got to have to deal with the motion. But that could be... Hmm. But uh, can you foreshadow a slightly amended motion, an alt rec to come up? No, on, only a deferment. Well, that would be me. OK, uh, I'll, I'll foreshadow a deferral. I seconded it, but I haven't spoken. And speakers, uh, set people who second don't actually have to vote for the motion. I seconded it just to get the thing moving. OK, so the, uh, just to um, clarify, we have a motion that's been moved and seconded. It's been debated. Um, I haven't spoken. I'm foreshadowing a, mo a motion of deferral, if it should get up. And then um, we have uh, um, everyone spoken. Oh, sorry, Councillor Voss. OK, you can speak, Councillor Voss. And then I'll ask Councillor Crawford to close. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would support your uh, motion for deferral. Um, I do believe that this uh, canary palm can stay in the location. Um, it probably just means a slightly reduced balcony on, on both the levels. Um, and I don't take lightly that the fact that there is a significant tree here, um, whether it's a optional or a non, not an Indigenous um, tree. Um, so I think it does need to have further consideration and be a well worded um, alt rec rec alternative recommendation. So I'd be um, supportive of a deferral so that we can get that right. Councillor Crawford. <laughs> As, yeah, but she's closing. OK, Councillor Crawford has um, relinquished her right to close. Side she sighed heavily. OK, I will now move to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare it lost. I'll move to the foreshadowed motion. Is there a seconder of the foreshadowed motion? Seconded by Councillor Brand. Um, I won't take spe speakers on this. It's been moved by me, seconded by Councillor Brand. All those in favour of a deferral? Against? I declare it carried. So, we have a deferral. And we'll take up the cudgels again next month. Thanks very much, everyone. I now move to agenda item 6.4, 28 Wellington Street, St Kilda. We have the two Peters, the uh, applicants, for the applicants. Can I urge that only one of you speak? There's no speaker for the um, objectors, if there be any. Could I ask you to state your name and, uh, and suburb? Thanks, Mr Chairman and Committee. Um, I'm Peter Barber, so I'm Peter number one. Um, I'm a town planning consultant from Urban Edge Consultants, and I've been running this planning permit application. Peter Dunn is to my left. He's the project manager from St Kilda Community Housing, and he's here to answer any questions about detail operationally. Um, this application was lodged about 17 months ago, and it's been a fairly lengthy process to get to tonight. 
Um, we had a consultation meeting November last year, and I think it was chaired by Councillor Brand, and there was a raft of people in this room who had significant concerns, I must say, um, when the application was originally lodged. It's an 11 room rooming house. I'm not sure if councillors are aware of this facility on Wellington Street. It's a 1980s vintage building. Um, that's the block next door. I'm not sure if we've got one of the subject site. Um, it has 11 rooms. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that the state government is really upping the ante in terms of the need to increase rooming houses throughout this part of Melbourne. And Department of Human Services has obviously got funding available. And this was seen as an opportunity to firstly upgrade the existing facility, which is about 30 years old and has only 11 rooms. We're in a general residential zone which allows a three-storey height. Um, so the opportunity was seen to provide um, additional rooming house in the form of individual bed sitters rather than the situation that's currently there where there are bedrooms with shared bathrooms. So it's an improved facility um, and it also increases the number of rooms um, or residents from 11 up to 28 self-contained rooms. There's also improved um, amenities for the residents in terms of shared spaces, um, a communal lounge in the north facing front garden and enhanced security. So as a result of the meeting we had a year ago, um, it was decided to have, it was an invitation put out to the residents to have um, a visit of some of the other facilities and we hosted um, a meeting at the 77 Grave Street and the recently updated facility at 2 um, Fitzroy Street. Um, and a number of the residents, sorry, resident objectors came along to that. And I think that meeting was very in, in, informative to all of them in terms of showing what these upgrades do in terms of the facility and the ongoing um, uh, the resident behaviour and the management regime that's put in place. And I see that the council officers have put a number of conditions, including a management plan, um, security arrangements and those sorts of things. Um, and by virtue of that process, I think it's been very good in the fact that we have no objectives here tonight. And I would put to council, I think that, that indicates that there's general support um, despite the original hesitation with the proposal. So I invite you to support the recommendation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Do you want to ask a question of the um, applicant? Yes, please, Chair. Sure. Um, just quickly, I was just wondering if you could give me an overview of the staffing. Obviously, I can't imagine this has a full-time staff member attached to it at all, nor would it be required, but how is maintenance and staffing and oversight of the facility conducted? Sure. As I understand it, there's no resident um, person within the facility that sleeps there 24-7. Um, but St Kilda Community Housing is obviously located around the corner on St Kilda Road. Um, there is a requirement to have 24-7 uh, contact there and during the daytime hours there's obviously a dedicated person who's on call visits there as well as um, making sure there's on ongoing um, operation management. I'm happy to get Peter number two to answer any specific questions. He's um, town planning sort of focused on this, not in terms of the detail of the operation, but um, I'm happy to assist where I can, but otherwise I'm happy to get Peter up if you like. And security arrangements, will there be um, uh, cameras, etc., on the entrances? I don't... Not, perhaps... Can, number two? It might be better if Peter Dunn addresses these questions, because I'd be... I don't want to misinform the council. Uh, yes, Mr Chair. Uh, my name is Peter Dunham. As uh, Peter Barber indicated, the project manager for St Kilda Community Housing. And uh, yes, that is the correct uh, scenario that uh, in the development, and in fact, even prior to development, there will be uh, security cameras installed uh, to monitor the situation. C Councillor Voss. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to ask a question about the residents um, and sort of relates to car parking. Uh, will the residents that are there now be the residents um, that will go in there after the development, after the renovations occur, or will they be different people? Uh, that sometimes is a bit of a vexed question because people are moved out of the property for uh, development purposes and uh, they're 
often resettled in other properties. We have 22 properties around St Kilda, so uh, depending upon their desire to come back and uh, reside at this location, they would be given the option uh, to come back. Uh, in some instances, uh, those matters would be uh, screened on the basis of uh, their, their performance as a resident uh, tenant. Okay. So the, 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 my question is around um, the car parking, uh, because there's not much car parking, and it was one of the um, residents' concern around the area. Uh, so I guess you won't know who has a car um, that comes back into the into that residence and whether um, there'll be enough car parking on site. Or are you able to answer that? Yes, look, I think past performance and history indicates that, uh, you know, of the 370 residents that we have uh, throughout uh, the 22 other properties uh, in St Kilda... Uh, there is very few, and um, I would say there'd be less than 10 probably in, in an overall context. Um, the, the facility that's provided in very close proximity to parking, um, a lot of these people come from a homeless background, so uh, often they haven't got the, um, the funds to be able to purchase or run a vehicle. Um, and, you know, one of those aspects would be that we wouldn't be encouraging anybody with a, a vehicle so much because of those circumstances. Okay, Councillor Voss. Thank you, one more question. Um, you know, congratulations on um, what was done with Eleonora. Would this be the same sort of quality upgrade um, as Eleonora? Um, I suppose the amenity will be the same. Um, the uh, floor area of those new uh, rooms uh, or units at uh, Eleanor at uh, Fitzroy Street, uh, bigger than what we would be able to provide here, um, but nonetheless the amenity will be so much improved because they'll be all self-contained. Thanks very much. <coughs> Councillor Brand, quickly. <coughs> Thank you for, um, well, it's, uh, for being P2 in this one. Uh, because I just would like to, you, you've mentioned um, the uh, security cameras. Um, P1 mentioned um, the the uh, uh, the upgrade of uh, of the facilities. What what just as a sort of a, a, a rough rule of uh, just that you could count on the on your fingers of your hand are the basic features of the development now that will provide a better um, living arrangement for the na for the neighbours to. To live next door to, I think the neighbours uh, had had obvious reason to be um, upset and alarmed. Maybe not a very large reason, but still there are reasons there. And I'm just, I'm just would like you just to outline the the, the sorts of uh, features of the new development which will alleviate some of those issues. Sure, um, I think probably as. Uh Peter Barber indicated the opportunity to take the objectors on a tour of a couple of our properties probably um, outlined the dynamic change that happens when um, there are opportunities to provide self-contained units. Um, I, I think that uh, arrests uh, some of the issues that we have been dealing with on this particular property and I, I think they're reasonably well known and we have concern uh, for the neighbours on the basis of that and I uh, we, we fully support the um, conditions that are set out in the proposed uh, uh, application that uh, I think for the neighbours will improve the situation with screening. Um, we, we will have much better security, although uh, I would add that the intention is to improve the security prior to any redevelopment. Um, and I just generally think that uh, the experience in the past has certainly been evident that uh, we have a different um, uh, outcome, if you like, in relation to uh, the, those properties being uh, provided with uh, uh, self-contained units. I mean, two, two Fitzroy Street is the perfect example. Um, I think all too long it went on uh, unattended and, and um, wasn't given the support and funding that it deserved. Uh, the outcome there has been tremendous from both our point of view and from the point of view of the okay, residents. Okay, Councillor Voss. And just note, um, Councillor Voss, you were saying that um, the uh, 
that uh, there is an alternative officers recommendation. Just yeah, wondering. Yeah. Um, There's been some deletions. And that's the only change, isn't it, Mr Schuster? So, um, no, 3D as well. Oh, 3D, yes. And an addition of habitable windows. So that's been moved, Councillor Voss. Seconded by Councillor Brand. Um, Councillor Voss. Just quickly, I'd just like to say uh, well done on getting this uh, rooming house upgraded um, for um, a person that's living here to have their own bathroom and to have their own um, kitchen is enormous and it provides a lot better amenity for them for the whole block. Um, it's safer and um, they tend to have you know, um, a better life as a result. So I think this is what we call best practice going forward. So. Um, good luck with all of that and, um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Brand. I really have very little to add to that. Great. Any further speakers? <laughs> there be none. I'll move to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I'll now move to agenda item 6.5. There are no speakers. Let's go straight into the uh, questions about this. Are there any questions? And you actually don't need to ask a question. You might actually be fine after a briefing for an hour this morning. Through, okay, there. through you, Mr Chairman, I do want to add that there is an alternative officer recommendation which yes. adds at um, condition 15 the reference to the deletion of 1,523.8 uh, square metre retail unit in the centre of the northern podium, which is clearly explained in the uh, officer report. Unfortunately, it um, seemed to have been omitted from the officer recommendation. So, Councillor Voss. Um, just uh, want some clarification around um, the recommendation, 3.3, uh, Condition 23, Developers Contribution. Just want to double check that that is captured in there. Condition 23. Uh, for you. I can't Mr. find it, sorry. That's yes. Right. yes. Mr Guttridge? For you, Mr Chair, yes, that condition is a condition which um, comes from the uh, existing permit. It is carried over. The change which is being talked about is uh, a matter of timing. Um, <coughs> it's a matter of um, being consistent with a range of conditions in this approval to allow um, such matters as demolition, um, uh, site examination for... Uh, environmental audit processes and uh, site remediation, um, bearing in mind that uh, in this instance they are proposing two basement levels which will require substantial excavation and um, to, uh, in those sort of circumstances, the uh, remediation, the shoring up of the site um, structurally um, all becomes integral. So this, this sort of condition um, allows um, timely um, uh, exercise of those um, scientific investigations as well as the structural sort of uh, shoring up of the site. It does not, in uh, uh, officer's view, um, uh, do anything to um, uh, uh, halt or slow the uh, delivery of the... Um, uh, development contribution in its instance, bearing in mind that uh, the bulk of the uh, contribution is uh, typically required at the completion of the development. Thanks, Mr Guttridge. Any further questions? Can we move to a resolution? Moved Councillor Voss, the um, amended officer's recommendation. Seconded Councillor Baxter. And any speakers? 
I move to vote. All those in favour, carried unanimously. Thanks very much, everyone. 6.6. Uh, .6. Um, this is 3, 339 Willie Willy Road, Port Melbourne. We have one speaker. Kelly Burns, can I ask you to just put on the record your name and uh, suburb? Uh, Kelly Burns, uh, South Bank. Um, as this is just an amendment to a permit condition, um, really I'm, I'm here to say thank you to, the, to, to uh, Simon in particular for his ongoing assistance and patience and commitment to our, to our client's project. Uh, to see it through to completion uh, and um, thank you also for the officer's assessment of the current amendment request. Uh, on behalf of our client, we commend the recommendation to you. Um, the officer's report explains why the first version of the condition uh, was not possible um, to achieve and um, our client with their engineer and our involvement, SJB Planning's involvement as well, spent time interrogating what could be achieved and uh, we consider it to be a, a good outcome and um, in the, with respect to the constraints, but a, a, a better outcome um, than what was there and we understand why the council had, the officers had uh, imposed the condition in the first instance, so thank you. Thanks very much, Ms Burns. Um, councillors, do I have a resolution? Moved Councillor Voss. Seconded Councillor Pearl. Are there any speakers? Move to vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thanks very much. So, um... <laughs> Urgent business. Are there any items of urgent business? Oh, 6.7. Aren't I a silly sauce? Um, can I have a resolution in relation to 6.7? Moved Councillor Voss, seconded Councillor Baxter. Speakers against. All those in favour? Unanimous. Urgent business. None. Um, confidential matters. Council, we have councillors, we have two confidential matters and relating to 11 to 12 Eastern Road, South Melbourne, and 147 to 149 Brighton Road, Elwood. I now call on a councillor, and it's been moved, Councillor Pearl, is trying to suck up to the teacher, um, to move, that the meeting be closed to members of the public to consider these two confidential items. Seconded, Councillor Voss. All those in favour? Carried unanimously.